And this is about the uh, sighting of the submarine? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I was transferred in a detachment from Fentress Field, Virginia, mm -hmm. which is located in the Norfolk area, from this Composite Squadron 15, where we were being trained as hunter-killer pilots to hunt down and kill German submarines, or enemy submarines. And um, they assigned a group of us to the Naval Air Station at Quonset Point, Rhode Island, to act as target planes for the training of lookouts from our own submarines. Our own submarines in World War II were battery operated beneath the surface. And while the submarine was on the surface, diesel. Yeah, they were diesel powered on the surface. But when they submerged, they would operate on batteries. Right, and when they surfaced, they would recharge the batteries. Recharge the batteries. Well, while on the surface, they had to have lookouts. And so the sailors would act as lookouts for enemy aircraft. And we acted as targets for them. We'd fly in over the submarine, and because of radio silence, the submarine would send us a light message, a blinker light message in code, proceed out over the horizon, and then return in any direction or altitude that you choose so that our lookouts would gain training in spotting you. Gotcha. And that operation continued until about 10, 15 in the morning on the 5th of May, 1945. The weather was very, getting worse every hour. It was spotty fog, clouds, it was very weird weather pattern that morning. But at about 10.15 in the morning, we received the blinker message from the sub. We are returning to Groton to port, cease operations. And we then proceeded to fly about 10 miles south of Fishers Island, the area that we're operating in, just below New London, and then headed east about two or 300 feet off the water headed east toward Block Island, Rhode Island. At that time, my radium and Clifford Brinson said, Mr. Bradley, I can't believe my eyes. He says, there's this German submarine there just east of Montauk Point, Long Island. And I looked out and there it was. German submarine on the surface. We could tell it was a German sub because of the bridge, because it was, looked, looks like a laundry basket with the railing around the conning tower of the uh, pipe railing. Whereas suppose the American had a very streamlined kind of fish yes. book. Yes, right. We had a very simple uh, bridge on the uh, American subs. So we uh, immediately checked, estimated the course and speed of the sub. She was heading toward the southeast ledge buoy, which any map will show even to this day. Southeast ledge buoy from Block Island. And what to do? All we had was gasoline in our tank, no weapons, so we couldn't go after the sub. We didn't realize that the uh, World War II was ending and that the German admiral, who was representing the German government at the time, Donuts. Admiral Donitz, had sent a worldwide message to all German subs surface and proceed to the nearest port. To this day, we'll never know whether that submarine skipper, young fellow, age 24, he, uh, whether he had received that message or not. But at any rate, all we could do was turn and head back, maintain radio silence, head back toward Quonset Naval Air Station. And I left the altitude of two or 300 feet and peeled off and got right down on top of the waves, hoping that they didn't spot us. Because if they spotted us, they would probably have uh, taken some sort of action to proceed into deep water and submerge or whatever. And say if you would have broken radio silence too, they might have picked it up. Yes, right? because the Germans were so sharp. And the radio we would have used was very, very high frequency, VHF, which is line of sight transmission. Quonset could not have hurt us because we were so low and over the horizon. In fact, we were far south of 
Naval Auxiliary Air Station in Charlestown, which was operating at that time. So we maintained radio silence, which was our order, and flew back to Quonset. Before we go there, now that we got a second, if you could do the one-two punch for me, could you talk about? Oh, yes. Talk about it, please. The Navy was training what I call the one-two punch. We had a fighter plane, maybe in an old uh, Wildcat F4F fighter, which was early in World War II, or the F6F Hellcat. I believe Hellcats were what we were using. The Hellcat would come in and strafe the submarine if we found the sub on the surface. And the torpedo plane, which was modified for anti-submarine with rockets under the wings, depth charges in the bomb bay, et cetera, would come down in a very shallow angle and fire the rockets short of the submarine. And the rocket head armor piercing would level off as it hit the water and hopefully pierce the hull of the, of the German sub. So it was a one-two punch, fighter plane followed by a torpedo plane. And uh, that was our training, hunter-killer work. And they assigned us to uh, baby carriers in the Atlantic. And uh, we were, that's why we're training down in Norfolk area, was we were waiting assignment to a baby carrier or jeep carrier. Yeah, the which is probably right. around anywhere from 475 foot length flight deck to 500 feet. Some of them were converted cargo ships, weren't they? they yes. They just throw a top well, on it. There was a ship we called, it was the one I qualified on out of Fort Lauderdale, uh, Port Everglades. And so many people would remember Port Everglades because that's where one of the ports they use leaving for cruises these days. Mm -hmm. But the aircraft carrier USS Solomons mm -hmm. was uh, there. It was a Kaiser coffin. Henry J. Kaiser, an industrialist, mm -hmm. built these Liberty ships. Very, God, they were, looked like a postage stamp, 475 feet. Now compare it to a converted cruiser where they put a flight deck on a cruiser of 750 feet or the large battle carriers of a thousand. Essex class. The Essex, Essex class, right. Yeah. The battle carriers. Yeah. And how big were they? And they were over a thousand. Oh, they were a thousand. Yeah. And of course, these days, the carriers were straight deck, not an angled deck right. like they are today. Now, why'd they change it from to angle deck? Why did they convert? What well, because that? to accommodate jets, high-speed aircraft, and also to avoid uh, a lot of crashes. Yeah, near the, near the superstructure, the bridge, right? right? Yeah, because right. it gets them off that way, right? Now, the straight deck carrier, the carrier had to not go directly into the wind to build relative wind over the deck so you wouldn't be going too fast when you caught a cable. But it would go so that you'd have the, the uh, wind about five degrees off the port bow. They did that to avoid the wind burbling, curling off the island of the carrier, mm -hmm. the superstructure where the admiral and the captain were located, flight command. So anyway, in those days with the, with the um, straight deck, we had nine cables that you could catch with four big barrier fences. So if you missed the cables, your prop would catch and you'd nose over into the uh, barrier fences. And uh, with over 150 carrier landings, I was very fortunate never to catch, never to catch a, a, or have one. Yeah. All right, real, real quick, we're gonna have, we're gonna have to change the tape in a minute. But while we're talking, you know, we're drifting a little bit, but that's okay. Okay. I want to ask you, uh, President Bush the first, uh, Herbert, uh, George Herbert Walker yeah. Bush. He um he was an Avenger pilot, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Let's talk a little bit. What do you think about him and his service? World War II and what had happened. Wonderful. Now, I was uh, just studying. He was in a converted cruiser. Yeah. Uh, Torpedo Squadron 51, I believe he was in. Uh, all I knew, I, I, he was supposedly one of our instructors at the Naval Air Station in Fort Lauderdale, which is now Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport. 
but I didn't realize until my classmate wrote a book about his life, uh, Commander Barnett down in uh, San Antonio, wrote a book about his life, and he says, George Bush was one of our instructors. Well, I did not know that at the time. <laughs> but uh, all I know about him is he's a very fine American and, uh, and, and, a, and a great, good pilot. And, and how was he as an instructor? Do you remember him as an instructor? You... No, I don't remember him at he had all. So many. No, there were so many. Yeah, yeah. Because I, what we did there when they uh, commissioned us in Pensacola, and we received our Navy wings, uh, was they would transfer us to operational flight training, where we would then get into a uh, fighter type aircraft, and uh, we had all our training to be torpedo pilots. This was in Florida, Fort Lauderdale, yeah. Florida, glide bombing. Not dive bombing straight down, but glide bombing and torpedo bombing. Now, now, uh, now President Bush, when he was your instructor, did he ever say, wouldn't be prudent? <laughs> no. Look, no. We're, we're, com we're coming to the end, so uh, okay. we're going to, I mean, we're going to change tapes. Okay. If you want, we can take a break or whatever you'd like okay. to do. But uh, I got like two, three minutes on here. So we're going to go back to where we were talking sure. about. Remember, we drifted a little bit. That's okay. But okay. Uh, we want to go back to when you, you were, so you're flying low over the water, coming back to Quantum. To Quantum. Okay. Okay, we're flying up Narragansett Bay, past Point Judith, the lighthouse, up the west passage of Narragansett Bay, toward the Jamestown Bridge, which at that time had the fog about halfway down the bridge. Mm -hmm. So I kidded with uh, my radio man, Cliff Brinson. I said, uh, Brinson, now's our chance. We're going to fly under the bridge. And he said, oh, no. And I said, I'm only kidding. So we popped up into the fog and over the bridge and down and got into the clear air again and landed on the northwest runway, 340 degrees at Quonset, taxied into the uh, area of seaplane hangar three and uh, parked the aircraft. Well, we were a detachment. We didn't have a commanding officer with us, and I think probably I was a senior naval aviator in the group, so I proceeded directly to the Admiral's office in the administration building, which is still over here at Quonset. And uh, they assigned me to an air combat information officer who listened to our story of sighting the sub, calling it a debriefing. And. Uh, that was from about one in the afternoon until four. This was Friday. Friday, okay. the 5th of May, 1945. When we were uh, released, told us that we could leave about four in the afternoon. Oh, yes. The, uh, the commander debriefed us, re reported the uh, position, course, and speed of the submarine and the time and so mm -hmm. forth. And uh, at four that afternoon, they, uh, he dismissed us, said they were reporting the sighting to the headquarters of the destroyer cruiser force Atlantic Fleet over in Newport. And uh, he excused us and we left for the day. That was Friday evening. When we left the building, the fog was so bad you couldn't even see across the street. It was really bad. So even if, the destroyer Navy received the position, course, and speed of the sub, it would have had a difficult time. Right. Because that submarine torpedoed a coal vessel, the Black Point, about two and a half miles southeast of Point Judith Lighthouse, Point Judith, Rhode Island Lighthouse. And uh, about 6.20 that evening, or somewhere close to six o'clock, and when you projected the course, or the speed rather, of that submarine. That's exactly where she would have been at that time. Where, the, where that coal carrier was? Yep. Back in 1985, the Providence Journal newspaper interviewed the captain of the Black Point, and uh, 12 lives were lost, which is such a tragedy. Well, how did you find out about the Cold. Remember you said about the Hartford newspaper? Oh, yes. 
we were released at four in the afternoon. And that evening, I went back to my hometown in Hartford. And um, the next evening, I was at a dance at uh, the Knights of Columbus Hall in the heart of Hartford, right downtown. Next door to the uh, dance hall there, the Knights of Columbus Hall, was the Hartford Times newspaper. And during intermission, I came from the dance hall up to the street level. And out of the front door of the newspaper came the newsboys waving newspapers saying, extra, extra, German submarine sinks coal vessel off of Point Judith, Rhode Island, 12 lives lost. I shook my head and said, oh my gosh, there goes my air medal. Wasn't, it wasn't funny. 12 lives lost. And I thought about it. I said, you know, even if the report reached Newport, the cruiser headquarters, they wouldn't have been able to do anything to prevent that sinking. The next day, the next morning, the Moberly and the Atherton Saturday morning proceeded out and sunk the submarine east of Block Island. Where'd they come out of? Came out of Newport. Now, the, uh, when you were debriefed, they obviously reported it to the Atlantic Command, right? They did, but there was no, no uh, record of it. One of the officials here at the Quonset Air Museum checked with the Navy records, and there was no record of that being reported. Now, does that mean they didn't report it, or just that the, you know what I mean? There was no record of it. And no offense, but you were you were a young ensign. Maybe they said, uh, "Do you think that maybe they said, oh, well, maybe you probably know, you we're seeing, seeing things, you're yeah. seeing German submarines, right?" Here. Oh, he quizzed us. Yeah, he quizzed us uh, at length. In fact, I I mentioned to the commander. I said, "Look, I said during Pearl Harbor there were radar operators who reported targets on radar that happened to be the uh, Japanese aircraft." And uh, I said, we know what we saw. There's no question about it. How do you think he took it, the, the gentleman who debriefed you? Um, he was very skeptical. Yeah. Very much. Mm. Mm. OK, and, and so. Uh, one thing I want to mention, too. Remember you mentioned about Portland, about the ship that was Oh, yes. Uh, I found out that one week before this happening, the USS Eagle was sunk off of Portland, Maine. The Navy reported the sinking as a boiler explosion. Well, one of the survivors of the USS Eagle said that it was foggy. However, from his life raft, a submarine surfaced right near the life raft and on the conning tower was painted a red dragon. So do you think that the U-853 was operating off, right off the whole right. New England coast, right? Right. Yeah, right. You know. I mean, it was probably a boil explosion because a torpedo hit it. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, many people have, uh, scuba divers have dove on the uh, submarine. It's in 200 something feet of water east of Block Island. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, one of the board members at the Quonset Air Museum, his hobby is collecting all this information that he can gather after plane crashes in the greater Rhode Island area and all. And he has the charts that came out of the navigation section of the submarine. One of the divers recovered the charts. And the charts were all of the South American coast. Isn't that strange? None of this coast at all here. Hmm. But to this day, we'll never know whether the commanding officer of that submarine, he was age 24, whether he received the message from the admiral. That's amazing. To and surface and proceed to the nearest port. I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I cut it. Yeah, no. To this day, we'll never know whether the uh, commanding officer of the sub received the message from the uh, German admiral to surface and proceed to the nearest port. Yeah, I mean, he could have been a gung-ho Nazi, or he could have been just ignorant of the orders, like you said. Right. Because I'll give you, I think I talked to you about this on the phone, but I want to re bring it back up. 
Uh, when I was talking in Toronto with Francis, she and I interviewed, <coughs> she and I interviewed uh, my fiance, right? She and I had interviewed um, Werner Hirschmann, who was uh, an engineer on, on a U-boat, which uh, was sinking ships off the Nova Scotian coast, off Nova Scotia, about the same time mm -hmm. that you spotted the U-853. Yeah. And Werner's uh, sub, they s surrendered to the Canadians, and uh, then their their POW camp was a hotel. <laughs> hey? So, yeah. but he was telling you know he was telling me stories about about from his side of, of things. So I might want to match this up actually in footage. Might be good. But, yeah. But yeah, he was talking a lot about the, what that happened with them. But you were saying about the uh, about the South American pl plans. A lot of U boats. I mean, there, there was a lot of plans to go to South America. Yeah. Too. So maybe that had something mm. to do with it. Right. Mm. Uh, 